Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Maria Herrera, and I'm a committee member of the Architecture Forum. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, uh, this evening, we are going to talk about the role of the city's public spaces in today's changing context and, and how the public spaces are now playing an, an essential role in uh, reactivation, not just uh, the local economy, but our city life and our social lives. So I am delighted to welcome to today, we have two, two speakers in, in the session. We have Ken Shuttleworth who is one of the world's leading architects who continues to, to deliver a, a portfolio of, of iconic, innovative and sustainable buildings. Ken founded Make Architects in 2004 and, and today they have uh, studios across the world in London, Hong Kong and Sydney. Um, uh, Ken also founded the Future Cities Foundation in 2013 which uh, focuses on advanced research and to generate debate uh, about the spaces we live in. And prior to this, can build a remarkable uh, portfolio of experience as, as partner uh, at Foster and, and Partners. Um, we're also very happy to have on the panel Dima Sogiev from Arab Associates. Dima is a landscape architect who has uh, focuses on landscape and city planning. Dima um, has, has done a lot of work on, the, on developing city green strategies, uh, guidelines for cities on, on, urban, uh, on urban participation, also developing uh, strategies for, for child-friendly cities. And more recently, she has been working with the Greater London Authority in developing the city resilience strategy uh, focusing on the role of meanwhile use um, and and how what this can play in making London a uh, more resilient place. So today we are going to give Ken and Dina an opportunity to share their thoughts on on the on the topic, um, and then we will have an opportunity for some questions and answers towards the end. So please do submit your your questions in the in the bottom below and we'll uh, aim to address them towards the end. Okay, thank you. So uh, over to you, Ken, please. Thank you, Maria, that's fantastic. Um, welcome everybody, it's great to be here. Uh, I just want to try and share my screen. And I'd just like to talk um, through, I think the role of the public realm. I thought I'd start off with London War Place, which I mean, I think, you know, anticipates um, a lot of the sort of uh, feelings nowadays in terms of public open space. The fact that we cannot just design buildings without thinking about their context and their place and making places where people want to actually be. You know, we could have filled this site up with offices, but you know, we left a lot of the site open to the public um, 24 hours a day. People can walk through the site at two levels. There's ancient monument, there's places where you can sit and, and eat and sit and, uh, and, you know, and enjoy the sort of garden space here. Um, and I think there's, there's a big move through what we've been through the last nine months in terms of thinking about um, public open space and greenery uh, within and without, uh, within and outside of buildings. So for me, um, the sort of the way that London Wall Place has actually sort of worked with office buildings, it works in the city context with London Wall, with ancient monuments, with, with gardens around the, um, some of the existing buildings, um, actually brings to life I think that part of the city, it makes it a place where people actually really want to go and really appreciate it. And I think, you know, even more now, I think the idea that, you know, we need these garden spaces, we need to feel connected to nature, um, especially during a sort of the situation we've been through with COVID, uh, we feel that sort of connection to space and air and light uh, and being able to breathe properly is really, really important. So, the, you know, the use of water in this project, the use of, um, fantastic planting um, sculpture um, actually gives you a sort of fantastic sense of place. And these are large places, these are large spaces. And the other one, um, the second one of these is Rathbone Square, which is actually not in the city, but it's in the West End. Um, this was again, taking a site and rather than just filling it all up with offices and residential to actually give 50% of the space to the public. And this is something that came from Great Portland Estate. It's the idea that we just make a proper garden, a proper place where people actually want to go to. And then wrap around that, Facebook's offices, as it turned out, um, and residential, 
as well. And you have this incredible place where you go through tunnels into it, you come into this sort of almost like an oasis within the city. Um, and it's, you know, full of trees and fantastic planting and again, sculpture, uh, restaurants and cafes around the perimeter. Um, and, you know, it, and it's really a sort of breathing place for, uh, for people who are working and living in the area. And I think it's, you know, because of where we've been the last, um, last nine months, you know, people stuck in flats with no balconies, um, people only being allowed out once a day, uh, people going to work where there's no green space, you can't open the windows, I think it's becoming, you know, really where we need to be moving to. And some of these projects sort of anticipate that, but I think it's, you know, these larger projects where you create public space, I think you have the, you know, it's really important you do so. And for me, these are sort of, both these projects were, you know, what we had to do, what we felt we had to do as architects to create um, a real sense of place um, and, you know, not necessarily the most maximising the value around the site, but actually giving the maximum amount of amenity to the public, which I think is really important. And then the other types of projects, um, and that's Rathbone again, it's just a fantastic place, you know, as it was last summer before the, um, before the virus. But the other types of space are, like the Oldgate Pavilion, Oldgate Square, we used to be a roundabout. And I think these are sort of found spaces that you know, we've, we've sort of driven around this and think, thought about it and what, you know, what is it actually doing? And, you know, trying to get rid of the buses, getting rid of the cars, making it into a place which actually is just for people. And I think there should, be, there should be more of these. And I think there will be more of these looking around the city. There's areas where you could easily do this sort of thing. So it's just a small coffee shop. Uh, some garden planting, you know, public space around the existing place. So it's a, it's a smaller space, there's not a lot of commercial benefit from this, but actually gives a, a greater amenity to the, to the people around who live in the area, who work in the area, and gives them a facility that actually is, you know, wasn't really there before. And I think again, yeah, the idea that you could create some of these, um, you know, in, in lots of different spots around the city is really important especially moving forward into the next, uh, the next generation of projects. And in a way, we're talking about well-being. And another little project, uh, last one really is um, 80 Charlotte Street, where the, the well-being of people who are going to work there is really important. I think Arab, Dima, you may be going to this building. Um, it's one of, the, one of our projects where we create this pocket park and they, you know, it's a very fashionable thing to say a pocket park, but actually it is a small park, which is open to the public. Uh, and it's surrounded by buildings, obviously since the first year of planting, but actually it's a really very nice sort of respite place uh, in Charlotte Street, off Charlotte Street, where there's nothing at the moment uh, until you get up to Fitzroy Square. Mm. So these sort of spaces, I think, you know, again, are really, really important. And I think for me, the idea that you can combine very large spaces as the sort of main way of working in the city to smaller spaces and almost found spaces like pocket parks and pavilions um, give you a sort of a breadth of different types of space which um, which work with well-being and a lot of work we've done with the Future Spaces Foundation has been about um, thinking about the the way um, the way the city works socially I mean what what is our city for now it's not just about working it's about people who go back to the city go back to work you know, want more just going into a box they want to be able to make sure they feel safe when they get there they've got um, amenity and they don't feel that sort of boxed into a into a place where um, where it's just you know a sort of concrete jungle I think it's you know we have to think more and more and more about the project going forward have to have much more open space um, and much more public open space you know even buildings themselves I think would be more like garden terraces rather than just sort of blank blanks of offices there'll be much more gardens on in rest in retail they're much in um, sorry in residential much much many more gardens in, in offices as well to make people feel like it's it's really worthwhile going back to the office really worthwhile going to the city so i think the social side of it's really important that sort of social connectivity um, for me is where we need to think about uh, the future of the city future of open space future of public spaces and that goes with the making sure they're on desire lines making sure there's actually things for people to do around the edge of the squares um, given cafes and restaurants, little kiosks, uh, you know, prim, uh, prime, prime position. So in summary, I think more open space, more public open space, more green space, um, more amenity and more sort of social value that comes from that will be, uh, be really important moving forward. And it all comes under the new, almost, almost new um, terminology of well-being. So I think 
Um, that's probably my 15 minutes up and I'll hand over to Tima. Tima, thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Ken. Okay, um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, three main things. One is the need um, for resilience. Two is the role of public spaces in making the city more agile and livable. And three, making a positive legacy from the crisis. So the need for resilience. Um, a colleague of mine, Jo De Silva, an Arab, she recently, a few months ago actually, has written an article um, which really resonated with me. And I, I'm, I'm going to um, give you a few quotes from that article where she says that COVID-19 pandemic class is classified as a slow onset extensive crisis. It's very similar to climate change. The early signs of a crisis can be hard to spot or their importance may be overlooked. If recognized early enough, there is a window of opportunity to step in, manage and terminate a slow onset crisis. Whether it's livelihoods, whether it's nutrition, whether it's mental health, social cohesion, among other aspects, they have a profound effect on the economy and society. And the impact of a crisis, therefore, depends on the resilience of society and the economy and the infrastructure that supports both. And this includes public space. This crisis is an opportunity to consider our resilience and capacity to maintain function, not just to COVID-19 and the wider impact it's having on the economy, but also to climate change another slow onset extensive crisis that requires transformational change. And therefore resilience is emerging as an agenda to drive um, future development of the city. And here I give two examples. Uh, one is the London uh, resilience strategy and the other one is the climate action strategy. So the thinking is embedded in both. In London Resilience Strategy, there is a specific action around um, encouraging meaningful meanwhile use in, in cities as a key action in making London more resilient to shocks and stresses. And just a few days ago, um, the Climate Action Strategy of the City of London was also released, where they actually committed to support the achievement of a net zero for the square mile by 2040 and invest 68 million pounds over the next six years to support um, this goal. And in fact, there's a lot of a lot in there around the role of public space, uh, a key component in achieving this um, net zero by actually making the public spaces work harder, such as carbon sink, etc. So what is the role of public space? I mean, as Ken mentioned, today, the role of public space is really, really important. But also, um, it's important in making our cities um, resilient, and they're not nice to have anymore. They are must have in resilient cities. <clears throat> they not only support the resilience of our cities, but also they have been supporting um, its recovery. And when I talk about public space here, I don't just mean squares and um, parks, etc. I mean streets, I mean sidewalks, I mean rooftops. I mean, balconies, atriums, uh, railway corridors, bridges, etc. So if we were to make our cities resilient, these spaces have to play a role. And over the past few months, we've all seen uh, how cities across the world have been reclaiming public spaces to meet, um, to meet a certain need, whether this need is economic need, social need, or health and well-being need. And a lot of these interventions have been done as meanwhile, meanwhile interventions. But this is not new to London. For those who know London really well, they know that 
in during the World War, actually, a lot of the spaces in London, including the picture on the right on Regent Street, and picture on the on the left uh, on the left Regent Street, and on the right is Kensington Gardens or Hyde Park, where actually these uh, public spaces have been transformed to become uh, food production spaces as part of the Dig for Victory campaign to actually feed Londoners. So this is really, as a concept, is not really new. And we're doing some work at the moment with the Greater London Authority to think about the role that these meanwhile uses um, can play in supporting the resilience of a city. And the fact that these meanwhile uses can actually be incremental and meaningful so that they're seen as transitional projects that bring early wins to achieve a bigger goal in the city, whether this goal is actually citywide or at borough level, and these goals can be net zero, could be resilience, could be well-being. And the diagram on the left here, um, it shows the range of motivations that um, people are um, uh, doing to actually uh, 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 promote meanwhile use um, uh, uh, projects. And one of the key ones is actually recovery and, and resilience. And um, this is also increasing the competitiveness of the city, the workplace, and making um, the public realm more appealing. So therefore, we need to think about an agile and livable city. And um, that enable us to test different uses to meet a particular need. For example, here again from the from the work we're doing on the GLA, we present examples of how um, different shocks and stresses can be addressed through a different meanwhile use interventions that will provide um, long term uh, long term benefits. But not only to support the resilience of, for example, the city of London of a certain borough, but also to contribute to the resilience of the wider city. And, um, and here are just some examples of meanwhile use projects that are happening all across London, whether it's sports and recreation, or whether it's promotion of, of art or parklets, you know, removing few car parking bays to put a small parklet, or even retail um, on a subsidized basis to encourage SMEs, or culture. And this happened, I don't know for those of you who've seen this or not, but you know, this is the ballet, um, the London Ballet. And um, this year they've actually were all over the city performing, but also providing affordable works ways, uh, affordable workspaces for, again, for startups and SMEs and individuals. And I think this is even more needed now as we're actually looking at more localization. So how can we be agile? You know, public spaces is one, but how can we think about retail, workplace, transport? And lastly, my last point is around positive legacy from the crisis. I think that as authors of the built environment, as architects, landscape designers, um, developers, etc., we really need to think about um, this like we thought about the Olympics, I think. How can we host this event, which in this case is COVID, while actually keeping the city functional and leave a positive legacy so that we can start thinking about our spaces so that actually they flood resilient or think about our rooftops as spaces for food production, but also spaces to encourage health and well-being. But also think about, again, another rooftop case study to think again about you know, sports and well-being and, and health. And actually, this is my last slide. Um, yeah, thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Ken and, and Dima. We had um, uh, really great presentations with uh, different perspectives. I like um, uh, your end slides, Dima, that we end on a positive note. And thinking about the legacy, I think it's a very interesting perspective on, on COVID and how this is changing the cities that, that we um, uh, inhabit. Um, we have a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, uh, the first one is for you, Ken, on um, uh, who would you say have 
have been your greatest influences in developing the way you think and approach the, the design of the public realm? So a couple of them. Uh, and then the other question that I should uh, read it now is about um, what are the key considerations for making a successful public spaces which are not at ground level? And is there a potential to push this further in the city of London? Um, it's an interesting point. I mean, there's the city itself in the square mile, um, there's not, um, we often have projects with rooftop uh, terraces, uh, Sky Garden, for example. So it would be interesting to hear your views as well as to what is the role of those other spaces that are not at ground level, but still offer opportunities for sports, health and well-being, as Dima was pointing out. Um, so who would like to go first with the questions? I can start if you like. I, I mean, I, I think my influences are really um, go back to being really fascinated by gardens and I mean I, I was brought up in Birmingham you know back in the 50s and 60s uh, I came to London um, in the 70s and I've always had uh, this sort of hankering for the countryside and the sort of the um, you know in a way the sort of antithesis of Birmingham in the 1950s was going to parks and gardens and going up to arboretums um, and I think for me as an architect I've always been uh, fascinated by Japanese architecture where you get this sort of fantastic fusion of the building and the and the landscape where you can't really tell when you slide a screen back whether you're inside a building or outside of a building and that's sort of when you think about the site as a whole with the building and the garden or the spaces at the same time um you know it's relatively new in the uk i mean you know it's, it's, it's normally a house and a garden you know it's normally a building and a garden um, whereas the japanese tend to you know there's a sort of melding of the two and i think that's become really important for us so when we're thinking about um, you know, both uh, the two spaces I showed you, which is Rathbone and London Wall Place, they're really, they're intermingled with the building. The building, you know, you go under the building into the space, you go you know, across a bridge, which is across a road into the space. You actually sort of, you are trying to blur the boundaries between the two. And I think, so I think for me, the sort of Japanese influence um, architecturally has been really important. And of course, I just love gardens, you know, I just love plants and um, you know, I've always been, you know, interested in that sort of keen gardener, as it, you know, even now. Um, so I think that's, you know, that being that sort of love of nature is really important. But I think it's also for, for, for as I was saying, for well-being. I think it's really important that nowadays, you know, we recognise that well-being is about nature. There's lots of studies on this, you know, plants in offices, um, balconies are really important to people. Um, and I think the idea that I had a couple of developer friends who said they you know, almost felt guilty about, you know, re reducing the size of balconies on some of their developments, um, you know, to sort of save money. But, you know, people in lockdown really, really need a bigger balcony. There's no doubt about that. Um, so whether that guilt moves into changing the way they think in the future would be interesting to see. Um, but I think the point about being above ground is really important, you know, the, the gardens and spaces um, on uh, London Wall Place are actually, there's loads of terraces, I think there's 17 terraces, um, different gardens up in, the, up in the sky, they're all private of course, but there's um, other projects we're doing where they're actually public, um, the one in, the number one Leadenhall uh, we're doing with, uh, with Brookfield, there's a public space actually up in, up in the air on that, on that project. And I think there should always be feelings that gardens shouldn't just be a ground level, they should be three-dimensional, they should be multi-level. multi, multi -level. And it's always had a bad reputation since the 60s with the sort of high-level walkways and things. But I think it's, you know, it can be done. We've done it at London Wall Place. It works really well. So, yes, I'd encourage it. I think it's fantastic to actually push people above ground, get views, um, better view the city from a higher level. Yeah. Um, Dima? Uh... Do you have any comments on, on, on that question about spaces not at ground level? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that we should be challenging the notion of public space, that it's not just at a ground level. We should be thinking about our rooftops. We even should be thinking about atriums inside the buildings. How can we actually make spaces more public and accessible to the public? There are great examples all around the world of how this, is, this has been done. So we should definitely be thinking outside the box, especially as our cities are becoming denser and denser and, um, and we're finding like less space for public space. So I think we need to squeeze as much as we can at ground level, but also think about other terraces or rooftops or even um, in, indoor, indoor landscapes. 
Yes. Um, I have an interesting question here about um, from the uh, COVID interventions in cities around the world. What do you think have, have been the most and least effective uh, interventions in public spaces from, from your experience and the research that you have done with the work at the GLA? Um, I think it's still very early to tell, if I'm very honest. We're still in, we're still in the situation. Um, we're still learning. We're still looking at what's happening. We know that in London, you know, there are streets that are being shut on weekends so that restaurants can take the streets and um, take up the streets and uh, social distance. Um, we know that there's all of these kind of pop-up um, cycle routes, etc. cetera. Um, I think that we should also be thinking about meanwhile use in a sense that, you know, providing also field hospitals, you know, providing all of these basic needs that will enable us to have that leap. But um, to me, so, so the, I, I don't think we can say yet, but to me personally, I think that the pop-up cycle lanes, at least in London, have, has been a, a great addition to the city. And I'm a cyclist myself and I can already see the difference. And I think hopefully that would make that positive legacy um, that I was talking about at the end. Um, because we really need to, I think, achieve um, the net zero emissions that the city of London, but also other boroughs and London as a whole has, um, has, uh, has put as a target. I think it's interesting though. I mean, I think the positive things come out of it was that those incredible shots in the early days of goats arriving in cities and you know, lions sleeping on the runway at airports and those sort of, you know, where the animals come back into the city because people are sort of not going around in their cars. And I think the positive thing about, you know, the, the atmosphere is cleaner, there's not so much pollution, but you can cycle and walk, you know, feeling that uh, during lockdown, you know, it was actually rather, rather pleasant, in fact. And I think that if the legacy is we can reduce car uses, usage and we can actually reduce, um, you know, petrol and diesel cars completely out of the cities, I think that would be a really good legacy for the future to try and improve, you know, not to just throw it all back and we all get back into sort of our Ford Transit and drive back into London, but the idea that we can actually get, um, you know, the city to be a greener place, a more uh, environmentally, not just greener from the uh, trees point of view, just greener from the sort of energy and, uh, you know, well-being in terms of the atmosphere. I think would be a would be a positive thing because it's not all bad people work from home because there's there's using less transport um so you know there are good things about working at home as well as working in the office and also i think what when ken mentioned this it just reminded me also of i think that one of the not necessarily linked to um mean values but actually one of the negative things i would say is actually that the the additional waste that we're generating as a result of covid um, and, and I'm sure for those, you know, if you're walking on the street now or cycling, you just see definitely more masks on the streets. Um, but that's not all that that's not the only thing, right? We have additional packaging for everything at the moment. So um, that will have a negative impact on the environment. Yes, um, with the point about meanwhile uses, uh, I was, um, uh, you mentioned, Dima, about that. Um, also thinking about the use of the spaces uh, inside the buildings, the atriums and the huge lobbies. Um, has there been um, any thinking about the use of the building itself of, of, of maybe combining uses or changing the use of certain building typologies to cater different uses? Yes, I mean, I think we've seen this in, um, in a case study in, um, in Peckham where actually uh, they have taken, it's, it's by makeshift, um, an operator uh, of uh, meanwhile use. And basically what they have done is that they've taken this uh, multi-story car park and they have temporarily transformed it into retail space, workspaces, mm -hmm. art and culture, um, et cetera. And um, actually we had spoken to them to see whether COVID has had an impact mm -hmm. on their business and business model. And, uh, they're still doing very well, um, but they're still doing very well also because of the support that the government has, has provided. So yes, in terms of um, in terms of meanwhile use inside buildings, there's a lot around uh, workspace at the moment and affordable workplaces. Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, 
there are a couple of questions uh, here on the topic about how 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 do we or how how architects have managed to convince developers on providing these public spaces, uh, taking into account the management costs of, of having uh, so much outdoor space, water features. So, what has been the, the strategy to to take them through through this journey and, in a way, um, uh, making the case that there's an added value for these spaces to be left for for social interaction. Well, let me kick that off. I, I think it's it's been depends on the clients. I mean, I think you know, there's lots of clients who are very, very open to the idea of you know doing the right thing, which is basically creating a sense of place in their in my, on their site. So if you go back to when I worked with, with Norma Foster, you know, more London, you know, we gave 51% of the site away to to public open space, and this is like you know 20 years ago. So I think there's you know there is a legacy of doing that in in the UK. In the right developers doing the right thing. Um, it obviously means if you give away the site, then you need to you know, create height elsewhere to, to actually cover the costs of doing that. But you know, I think the trade-off you know, is, is actually worth it. If you go back to sort of, you know, Corbusier and Villa Radeurs, where you know, he basically had a sort of field and been tower sticking out of it, um, you know, where you basically sort of, sort of spreading everybody out, you just put them all in a tower. I think that you know, was a fantastic concept, which got sort of, I don't know, butchered really in the 60s when we actually tried to do it ourselves but I think that idea that you you know you you trade between public space and height um, is always a, a thing on a project and who's ever asking the question I was developed for an architect but the I you know that is the battle always height against public space and I think it's you know a project needs to make a certain amount of money especially if it's a developer project um, you know let's face it there aren't you know they're not great city councils producing these gardens, you know, in these spaces. We are, you know, reliant on developers on private land actually creating these spaces for people to actually use. Otherwise there wouldn't be any. Um, so the developers have to make it work. So there's always this trade-off, can we go an extra floor, have a bigger space, go extra two floors, have an even bigger space. And that trade, you know, whether you work in Hong Kong, whether you work in London, whether you work in Sydney, is, is the same. So it's a sort of, it's a balance, I think. Um, and I think the, the, you know, the question about sustainable, um, you know, the operating costs of gardens. I mean, that's, that is, you know, you have to just, you have to just do that. You have to spend the money on, on maintenance. You have to be able to close the garden for certain times of the day, just to sort of do the weeding and get the thing back to, back to sort of looking, looking good. And I think this has to be part of the equation. You just have to build in the fact you have to have gardeners. Um, you're not going to get away with that. And this is just a concrete slab, which nobody wants to, uh, <laughs> to go on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, that's just part of it, the uh, the maintenance cost. So I think convincing, convincing developers is, you know, do try to do them them, you know, wanting to do the right thing. Often, you know, they don't often they don't want just to sort of fill it all up, um, you know, as low as possible and not have any space. They want it to be a great place because they want to attract their tenants, attract their uh, users of the building. It has to be a great place, otherwise they won't, people won't want to live there or go there. And I think now the next generation of buildings, you know, where we have to have sliding doors that open, where we have to have taps that just work automatically, where we, you know, we don't touch anything. There's no stainless steel, it's all copper, you know, in terms of materials. Um, there's lots of um, you know, inbuilt uh, sort of new things which would have to sort of accelerate what we would normally do because of COVID. Um, and I think that's really exciting. As an architect, it's really exciting to think about how we can design a building to be uh, the next generation that actually is not obviously COVID secure, but which is a current term, but you know, COVID, there's a way of actually handling um, the sort of COVID thing with, um, you know, in a building, uh, you know, so people can actually still come to work. And also, I mean, the thing that if people are demanding green space now, especially after COVID, so actually you will see that in the property market, there's a high demand for properties that have a balcony or that have a green space. And so people, Will want will expect a green space because during the lockdown people really valued having a green space, and also I think there are I mean the GLA is trying to do things to to enable developers, um, and designers to to have a certain percentage of green space such as the urban greening factor for example, um, and again I mean as Ken mentioned the cost of gardening 
you know, actually it's insignificant if you actually think about other costs um, for the management maintenance of the development of the buildings. And I think there is a role for the community to play. You know, today we live in buildings, we don't know our neighbors and it could be, you know, maintaining the garden by the community could be a really interesting way of actually, you know, fostering social cohesion, people getting to know each other, but also, you know, reduce the costs of maintenance. Mm. I mean, why, why don't you have gardens where you can pick the apples, you know? I mean, why yeah. don't you have public spaces where yeah. you can go and um, pick tomatoes? You know? Why don't you just sort of think about it more like in a sort of allotment or, you know, food for free? I mean, it would be great to think about it like yeah. that with, you know, with public involvement. Um, I don't know whether you follow Monty Don's sort of tours around the world, but he's done a sort of 80 favorite garden. He's been all over the place. And some of those, the ones, the most interesting ones, are ones where the community has sort of taken a site of rubble and started to grow lettuces for the community. And those are really exciting, sort of social, the way the, the social side of that city, particular city works, and everybody comes together um, around a garden. It's basically about producing food. Um, and I think, you know, you could, why don't we do that more? You know, we fight mm. over allotments in Fulham, you know, it's because we can't get an allotment unless you, you know, unless you live there, unless you've been on the waiting list for 25 years. But, you know, it'd be great if there were more. Um, people, you know, quite enjoy it. And it would be mm. great for the public spaces that people can go and, you know, pick the fruits. Why not? And actually also, I mean, we should think about not just the developers, right, but also cities. I mean, a lot of cities and boroughs, you know, they don't want to invest in green infrastructure or green space because, again, for the maintenance costs, but actually cities like Hamburg, for example, they've done something really interesting where um, they have something called rainwater tax, where actually the municipality will tax all surfaces that are impermeable. And they take that tax and then actually reinvest it in, uh, in green space. It's, it's very, that actually even includes um, green roofs and they tax themselves as well for the parks because if the if the surface is impermeable so there are innovative ways to actually um you know find ways to to cut the costs or to get money for the maintenance yeah. yes i think it's a very good point what you mentioned about it's not just developers it's the councils and myself as a as a as a person working with the city of london corporation there's always this behind the scenes battle when when there's more space and we want to create more greenery there's always the flashing light of maintenance and um, uh, longevity materials so i think there is a conversation there to be had of putting this more at the forefront of, of, of design making and i think and and when we think of new projects and new initiatives i think the green infrastructure and and well-being are as are starting to take a lot more um, uh, importance in the dialogue, I would say. <clears throat> um, there is an interesting question here about um, if we see that when the city, <clears throat> if it will have just um, um, arteries for electric buses and taxis and cars, uh, if they would be banned and only um, small electric delivery vehicles are used to deliver goods, if you see that that as a possibility and when do you think this may happen yeah i mean i think that's you know the consolidation of waste the consolidation of deliveries i think is really important i know what we're doing with the crown estate in in westminster is looking at that where they have an off-site you know, out of um out of the immediate area place where you consolidate all the deliveries then you actually organize deliveries on a sort of proper basis rather than you getting you know, if you order something on Amazon nowadays, so you order three things, they all come from three different vans, even though they're all from the same thing. And I think that's got to stop. Um, I think there's, there's got to be, um, you know, having got an electric car, which is a fantastic thing. You know, you know that it's, you know, it is the future, having driven it, um, you know, it's fantastic. And the, there's no uh, future for diesel cars and uh, petrol driven cars in central London. They will def definitely disappear. And I think uh, Robin's point there is absolutely right. They will definitely go. And it's just a matter of when. And I think it might happen sooner than you think. I think it might happen, you know, with the green, the green agenda, um, trying to be zero carbon, you know, in, in what is only a few years away. That will be the first thing to go. But I, I think, you know, we should close more streets. Down. There's lots of little streets that don't really need cars down and they could just be pedestrianised. You know, Charlotte Street's for one example, which we all know and love, um, around Fitzroy, you know, why do you have a car going down there? You know, it's, it's alone where they've got the, the barriers out so you can actually sit out on, in, the, in the road to, uh, to eat, you know, and why isn't it always like that? Why shouldn't it be like that? And there's lots of other streets where, you know, why do you have cars in them at all? 
Um, and I think deliveries is a huge issue. And the, and the idea of delivering by drones, I think is just around the corner, the idea of delivering um, in this, this, from these consolidated centers where you actually organize what you're doing. So you actually make sure you only have one trip rather than three, I think is the, is the way to go. Um, there's another question here that just um, came up from, from, from Clarice at the City of London about um, uh, cultural uh, institutions and how they are struggling at the moment with museums and theatres closed. So, so what is the role of the public spaces in, in promoting art or new forms of art and how it could be used as a platform to support the cultural um, manifestations across the city? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, the public realm have a big role to play, whether, you know, this, the galleries and the theatres are closed or not. I think that there is an opportunity to externalise a lot of that into the public spaces. And I give the example of the London Ballet, which in the summer they were actually performing all along the canal. And it was fantastic. And there were people just, you know, watching in the audience. And we have also the, the likes of the London Design Festival, where actually we've seen in Broadgate, for example, where Pop, Paul Coxage Studio, they've created an intervention there, etc. So I think that um, the opportunity is there. I think it's just about, you know, start talking to the right people, engaging with the right stakeholders, and to make that happen. Um, so I don't think we're short of ideas in terms of how to do it. It's just mm. the mechanism to enable that to happen. But you think some of the best times in London are when you've got the art fair in, in Regent's Park and all the sculptures are out around, the, you know, you walk around Regent's Park and it's, it's like a sculpture gallery, it's fantastic. Mm. You think about outside London, the sort of Yorkshire Sculpture Park, um, mm. there's lots of examples where we could actually have art outside uh, around the country, which I think, you know, the Housing Worth Gallery down in, 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 in uh, Dorset as well. Um, so I think that's a possibility. And you think about open air performances, you know, the one in Regent's Park, um, you know, it's not quite open because you've got a, a sort of uh, enclosure around it, but you know, Kenwood as well, where you can actually have open air theatre, open air concerts, you know, I think it would be fantastic to think about, you know, mm. getting out of the building, getting out to the public mm. space, um, you know, even spaces at the British Museum around, around the, uh, in the forecourt there, in front of St Paul's Cathedral, you know, there's lots of spaces that could be used for these, uh, these events. So yeah, I think it's, as uh, Dima said, you know, think we need some more, you know, we've got imagination, we just need it to happen. <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's an interesting point with, um, that uh, links to another question that was um, shared now about um, uh, covered areas and with uh, London's uh, iconic weather and how that would play a role in in actually making those spaces livable, I mean, livable and usable throughout the year, not just in the summer. Uh, I'm not sure if covering spaces is the solution, but um, I don't know. It's an interesting point of how spaces could perform throughout the whole year in all temperatures. I mean, I think I think that I'm just going to say this anecdotally, but you know, I started cycling back to work, and um, actually, my partner said to me that. You know, it doesn't rain a lot in London, but actually rare, it rarely rains. And if it rains, it's actually really silent rain, so you don't actually feel it. So my, my response basically to say that I don't think we should let the rain prevent us from creating, you know, amazing spaces in the public, public space. If we want to be somewhere, we will make it and we will be there. So I'm not sure about this covered, covered areas, maybe, maybe some, but... Um, I think we should be outdoors. It's not the weather is not that bad. It's, it's portrayed. <laughs> I, I think the uh, I think the um, the weather's great. I quite I quite enjoy the rain. I've always quite enjoyed the rain. As long as you're wrapped up properly in the right coat with boots on, it's fantastic. I quite I really always, always walk in the rain. I love it. And I think when we've tried in the past to do a public space, it's actually got a roof on it. And I'm thinking of Tower Place is one I worked on many many years ago. As soon as you put a roof on it, that public space suddenly becomes private. There's a little security guard ushering you out. Mm -hmm. And that actually, that space in Tower Place actually is open to the public, but people don't feel it's there. They feel it belongs to the mm -hmm. office building. And I think that's that's a shame. So I think that maybe it was the way it was done, but you know, at the time, the idea of being a public space that's covered, you know, was the sort of ambition. 
um, and it's actually turned out to be much more private than you think it is. I think that's uh, that's part of me covering a space. Um, and you think of the British Museum space, you know, which is public, but you don't really think about it's outside. It feels like it's actually inside. So I, I agree with him. I think you just keep it open to the rain. The building we did in Birmingham, the queue, we actually kept the, the main atrium is actually open to the rain. So it rains in the atrium, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it was like you're outside. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I, th I think we've come to the end of our questions. I um, hope I haven't missed any of them. Um, there was a point that uh, was made uh, earlier about um, on the meanwhile story that um, uh, it is a great way of um, getting onto more permanent projects, but how does that um, kind of go together with the more permanent infrastructure, mm. such, like such as parks and um, city open mm. spaces? I think one of the main challenges with meanwhile use is that you create something temporarily and you create a community around it. Let's say you created a temporary allotment, for example, you create a community around it. And then when this plot is up for development or something else happens in that plot, the problem is that the community you've created around it disappears, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the key challenges that we tried to address by saying that if we have a temporary allotment that has proven to be successful, that has created a community around it, and let's say the plot is up for development, can we in some way integrate the allotment into the development by maybe putting it on the roof or by maybe moving it to somewhere in the garden? And that way you don't use that community that you've created. And I think this is, this is one of the... I would say, um, you know, key key disadvantages of meanwhile use, and I think that you know we need to think around this to somehow make that leap into permanence. Mm. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I, I remember I, I, a very good example of that is actually in, was in Covent Garden. Um, so when the market moved out back in the seventies, there was a, a site called the Odom's Press site, um, which is actually where the um, on Longacre there's two buildings either side of. Uh, on that site at the moment, it's both uh, one residential and office building. And on that site, when the Odin's building was was um, half demolished, it became an allotment, which was sort of taken over by the locals. Um, and of course, there was then a fight when it actually came to developing it, even though it was actually being developing as, as residential for community use, it was still a bit of a fight. Um, and I just remember, you know, one guy digging his way through it to the very last minute when uh, when the bulldozers came in. So I think, you know, it created probably enough bad feeling. The fact it was, you know, it was an allotment became something else. Um, you know, exactly what Tim is saying. I think, you know, there's that, there's that point in time where it becomes very, very negative. And of course the allotment didn't get incorporated on the roof. I didn't get incorporated into the project at all, just disappeared. <laughs> yes, it's interesting. Um, so we are we are getting towards the end of our session. Um, so it's been some uh, really really interesting points and a lot to think about. And uh, are there uh, any uh, other uh, further thoughts, uh, Dima and Ken, that you would like to kind of leave to the audience? I mean, maybe my last thought is could be maybe a little bit provocative, but I think that you know the city of London not just city of London, but generally London is, uh, uh, Maria, maybe it's, maybe it's time for you to go. <laughs> uh, um, I'm in the office and the lights went off. <laughs> I mean, I think that it's, it's a little bit provocative, but um, I think we need to think about the, the, our workspaces and our, our office space and what can we do with that to actually increase green spaces in the cities. And I'm not sure what that is, um, but I, you know, there could be some opportunities there that we need to think about, whether it's related to food production or whether it's related to, you know, arts and culture, whatever. But um, I think I'd like to see some really cool ideas of what we could do. I think from my point of view, I'd like to see um less architectural type you know spaces i'd rather see um spaces are actually not really designed 
Um, I think I'd rather see spaces where people get involved and, you know, it's like a sort of community space rather than sort of, you know, us as architects or a landscape architects come in and, and just tell people how it should be on a sort of, on a sort of Versailles basis. It just feels, you know, slightly alien often. And I think trying to design spaces which actually work in almost a naturalistic sense or a natural sense where people actually feel, you know, much closer connected to them. I think it's um, it's what I'd like to see. At the moment, I think a lot of our spaces are very rigid, you know, quite hard. Um, you know, lines of trees that you know look quite suburban sometimes. You know, rather than just being clumps. You know, I think there's, you know, I think the approach to landscape architecture, the approach to architecture, I think should be. Um, I'd like to see it much wilder, much you know, more exciting, more, um, you know, more natural. You know, rather than you know, as a designer is trying to design a space. You know, somebody should come in and just help us to sort of loosen up a bit, I suppose is what I'm trying to say, and make it more, you know, into a space that people would actually engage with rather than feel alienated from because it looks too architectural. Yes, um, I couldn't agree more. I think there's, there's an element there of, of appropriation and um, identity with some spaces just by, by, by letting them be used by, by the local community. Um, so great, fantastic. Uh, I think we have now reached to, to the end. Uh, I, I would like to thank you, Ken and Dima, for joining us in this uh, fantastic session. I hope uh, the audience um, have, have, have enjoyed the, the discussion. Um, from the City Architecture Forum, I would just like to say that uh, we have another session coming up on Tuesday, the 20th of October, where we're going to talk about uh, Sticks at uh, Orsman Road. So it will be a, a different talk, but still very interesting on the building. Um, so please do go to the website for more details. And thank you again. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks. Bye. Thank